So next week, I'm giving this week's lolly and next week's lolly. So all I need for you to get a lolly is one leadership lesson learned. Something that was learned last week to tell me that my time wasn't wasted here. <laughs> so Lisa. I um, had the vision and I got to um, speak out the vision to my team um, with the strategy right. and they took it and they were on fire now to then go out and do what they need to do. Fantastic. Okay, good. Lolly. One lolly. That's one, one, one lolly. But so that's this week's lolly. And, and this week's <laughs> All right, we'll have to and we'll have to see. We'll have to see. Who else? I uh, want one thing, just one thing, Kara. You learned about leadership in a loud voice last week. <laughs> I didn't Nothing at all? No, I did. I didn't feel like that? I've had a crazy week in my head. Okay. Maddie? Um, when you're uh, actually uh, Oh, I got lollies! Sorry, sorry, hold that thought. I'm gonna get one lolly, one, and then pass it on. Yeah? Uh, when you're in the class position to uh, keep it simple and simple, and not just uh, like uh, occasion. Okay, that's this week. We didn't touch on vision last week, but uh, no lolly for you. Uh, <laughs> last week. Ethnic, ethnic culture. Ethics? Ethics and culture. Yeah, <laughs> ethnics as well. <laughs> <laughs> and we're That's good. One lolly for you. Last week, Machek. Uh, just a system level of uh, uh, leadership. Uh, Great. Tell us about that. Uh, just putting in place systems so you can support your supervisors or people who can go on that and go on that. Yep, so the levels of leadership. What was the level one? Chun. Sure. Level one, basic level. You can look through your notes quickly. Jane, ministry is the first level, isn't it? That we are called to serve people, help people. Okay, so Jane gets a lolly. Pass that through to Jane. No, 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 not you. You've already got your lolly. No, you failed your lolly. Level two. Supervision, where you, you know, after doing it, now you get like an assistant. Okay? And uh, does anyone remember level three? Mark? Leading a small group. Yeah, so you've got a group, uh, not, not leading a small group, as in a connect group, right? Okay. A, a team, yep, so you're now a leader of leaders. And then what's level four? Strategic, yeah, so now you're becoming more, rather than just one group, you're seeing numbers of groups, you're looking at strategic plans, you're looking at more of the strategy side. And the fifth one, the big picture. That's good. My wife gets lollies and Rachel as well. She gets lollies. All right. Uh, fantastic. Okay. What's the difference, Brad, between leadership and ministry? Helps. Helps, helps, with, helps them grow. Helps Who's them? them? The, the other leaders. You're, you're, like, you're leader of leaders. Yep, you're a leader of leaders. Good. So ministry is people that do the, yeah. the work yeah. and leadership directs, influences, ministers. Okay? So ministers, ministers to people. Did you guys get that? Yeah. That's really, really important. All right. Good, I think so. I think so. Any other thoughts? Define, yeah? Leaders to do the work of ministry and, and more ministers. 
Do you know what I mean? Because you require a shift in the paradigm thinking in order to train, recruit, release, direct, strategize. And, and most pastors are too busy visiting everyone in hospital, feeding everybody, welcoming everyone at the door, leading the worship, and then preaching, and then driving, you know, Auntie Hilda home, you know, type thing. And so we need to understand that in, in, in a small organization or business, or in a small church, um, that that can be done. But if, if, if the church continues to grow, then the leader has to change. And of course, if you run your own business and stuff like that, you'll, you'll know that as well. Okay? Fantastic. So, um, who has done their weekly test hands up? Good. Who can't do their weekly test as of yet? Okay, we're going to sort that out. And who read chapters 1, 2, and 3 before this session? Uh, honesty is good. For those without their hands, endeavor to do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 by next week. No excuse next week. First week, grace to all of you. But second week, third week, sorry, we, we need to catch on. And you know what? It's so easy to read. And he's such a good writer. And it's all stories. Yeah. But he um, teaches really, really well. Uh, today we're talking about vision. So you know if you, uh, like Maddie, have done a couple of weeks. Maddie's actually done week one, week two, week three worth of reading and tests already. Uh, because they come in on Monday and they get all their jobs done, which is fantastic. Um, so that's where he's a little bit, he's going to help us today by actually being a few steps ahead. But today we're actually talking about vision being the leader's most powerful tool. Vision being the leader's most powerful tool. And uh, I want to share a little bit about our journey because that's really uh, what they've asked us to as lecturers to share our journey. About 12 years ago, Sharon and I, we were the youth and children's pastors of a church called Perth Christian Life Centre. They're now Life City Church. And um, we lived in Ranford. We had uh, one child at that time. And I remember I was in bed and it was very, very early in the morning and God gave me a vision or a dream. Actually, not a vision, but I saw us um, establishing a church in the area of South Lake in Jandicott. At that time, we were the children and youth pastors We've been in that church since I was seven years old. This is now, you know, I'm 27 years old. The 20 years I've been in that church. And we were on the leadership team there. We were on staff. We were just really loving being in that church. I literally thought I would die at Life City Church. Like, I wanted to die there. I wanted to be there for the rest of my life. I love my senior pastor. We just love the ministry there. And God gave us a vision and a dream where um, we would plant this church in South Africa, and I saw people coming and getting saved at this church, and I saw the atmosphere over South Lake changing, and I saw marriages being restored, and I saw young children and teenagers coming to Christ, and I saw the crime rate in South Lake dropping, and I saw the community talking about this church, and I saw hundreds of people coming from the north, from the south to the east to the west to the central point, the center point, where there was like a drop from, uh, from heaven and it, would, it splashed into the ocean and it just rippled all the way out through every layer of society, through the government, through the, 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 the education system, through everything. That was this vision, this dream that God put my heart. And I woke up and I said to Sharon, I think, I think God's, God's calling us to plant a church. And um, Sharon, she said, yes, I know. And then she went back to bed because God had already spoken to her about it many, many years ago. And he decided to tell me at that spot then. And because of our difference in personality, probably uh, I needed less time because I like to do things too quickly. And she probably needed more time because she is a process and a details person. So, so God was so good and she kept the secret from me. He kept the secret from me and I was the last one to know. <laughs> so anyway, that's how it started. We got this vision. And, you know, at that time, you need to understand, we were young ministers. We were a young couple. We really, I hardly ever preached at church at that time. I think I preached three or four times to adults. I was a children's pastor. All right, 
Um, we had no money to start this church. We didn't think anyone would follow us to start this church. And if it was us, we wouldn't leave Fritz and CLC to follow us. So, you know, you know what I'm saying? Uh, who is going to do this? This is a ridiculous idea. And I remember sitting with this vision and this dream, this heart thing from God, saying, God, this is too scary. This is impossible. Sharon knows about it. Anyway, I thought I'll, I'll just bring it up with my senior pastor. So I, I talked to Pastor David, and, and he was so moved, and he said, you know what? God's been speaking to me about this as well. He said, God told me you've outgrown your shoes here. He had a cry. I had a cry. Everyone had a cry. And, and we're on this journey now of, of starting this church that I literally think nobody would ever turn up to. In fact, the first day of... Um, Centerpoint Church at South Lakes uh, Performing Arts Centre, I remember just standing in shock as these people started streaming in. Like, who are you? And what are you doing here? And why would you come? Like, that's the sort of questions, you know, going through my head. And I'm going, oh my gosh, they're all coming to this church. And and, and this vision that God has put in our heart, even though it's so impossible, has now become a reality. All that we see now started in that vision. And because we surrendered to God's plan, to God's vision, and did what we needed to do, so it's not just God doing it, but we partnered with God. God loves to make visions into a reality. He loves to increase um, His kingdom by putting a seed in our heart, a picture in our heart, so that we can outwork his plan. See, center point is not Joel's vision, it's God's vision. Life City Church is God's vision. Oasis is God's vision. Your ministries that you're in, God has a vision for that. He wants to outwork something that he sees in his heart, and the way he does it is he sees vision into people who are obedient and willing to hear and willing to run with the vision. So it's really him. He's got a plan. And he's looking for people who are willing to say, give me a vision, Lord. I will step out of the boat, trust you, and run with it. We see it with Nehemiah. God gives him a vision to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem that were so damaged and so broken and under occupation with so much opposition. But God had a plan for the, the walls of Jerusalem. And so he finds Nehemiah and he rebuild that wall. Now Nehemiah gets a vision and he obeys and he does what he has to do. But it was actually God's plan. We see that with David, who has a vision to build the temple, and even though he didn't get to finish it off, the vision was actually placed in his heart by the Lord. We see that about Abraham for the nation of Israel. The vision actually came from the Lord. He said, look up to the north, the south, the east, and the west, all this land. I give. The vision comes from God because God has a plan for the earth. He's got a plan for his kingdom on the earth. And he's actually looking for you and I to be able to see his vision and obey it and outwork it. Did you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. But how wonderful that God actually has a vision for your life. Yeah. More than just for the church, he's actually got a vision for your marriage. He wants to outwork his kingdom in your marriage, in your children, in your family, in your business, in your career. And it's his vision and his plan. So what is a vision? A vision is a picture, really, isn't it? It's a picture of what things could be like. It's a clear picture of what a leader sees his or her organization being or doing. That's what John Maxwell said. Vision is a clear picture of what the leader sees his or her organization being or doing. But of course, our textbook Hybels sums it up perfectly in another way. He says, a picture of the future that produces passion. You need to write that down because that probably will be included in something. Vision is a picture of the future that produces passion. 
Do you know, after I saw this church in my heart, as I said before, South Lakes was a dodgy, dodgy suburb. I, I lived in Jandicott across the freeway. I knew what South Lakes was like. I knew my cousin went to the high school. Four principals in a row had breakdowns after a year. There was violence. It was no, noted as the worst senior high school in Western Australia. It had the lowest, one of the lowest socioeconomic areas in the WA. It had crime rates. It was really high. It was, it was really bad. And that's the picture. The solution for South Lake was Jesus Christ through the church. And the vision was, Joel, you're going to leave beautiful Perth Christian Life Centre and all eight of your staff and your good salary and the hundreds and hundreds of people that are currently looking to you for leadership and you're going to take a rowdy band of whoever will come to whatever place with maybe no aircon and Jane was one of those people who came uh, and, and, and you're going to plant a church and, and, and God's going to use that that's the picture that's the vision but here's the wonderful thing when you start looking at that vision you start producing passion after a while I'm going I can't stay here I've got to go and do this dream this vision that God has put in my heart and the vision actually draws you into your future the Bible says without vision people perish that's Proverbs does anyone know where that's from? I have it somewhere in my notes. Proverbs 29, 18. Proverbs 29, 18 says, Without vision, people perish. Or, without vision, people cast restraints. If you have a vision, it's going to draw you forward. It's going to pull you into your destiny. It's going to draw you to the God plans for your life. If you don't have a vision for your life, you just go around in circles. Do you know one of the, the greatest things now they're starting to work out how, how some kids go into drugs and alcohol and dinner and other kids don't. And that the, the biggest difference is the kids that are drug proofed are the kids that are from a young age given a vision for their future. Maybe it's a sporting vision or an education vision or a vision for the arts. Or, and you know what? Even though the people come and say, hey, listen, why don't you try it? They go, no way. I've got a vision for my life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the next senator. I'm going to be the next sporting basketballer. I'm going to be the next. And so that vision actually pulls them forward. But without that vision, they can't stop restraint. And so what's the point? I might as well. Maybe my life is all about drugs and experiencing and living it up. But someone with a vision gets discipline, gets focus, and is pulled forward. And so that is the power of having a vision. But listen, this is Christian leadership. So more than having a secular vision, we need to have a God vision. We need to have a vision that draws us into God's plan for our life. And here's what we need to know. Number one, God is visionary. God's nature is visionary. In Genesis, when God created the heavens and the earth, and he said, let there be light, he did go, oh, that's what light looks like. He actually saw light before it was created. Isn't that true? He wasn't shocked. Oh, that's what trees are like. That's what animals are like. <laughs> oh, thank you. No. He actually saw it and he spoke it before it even existed. So God has this visionary component in his life. We are created in God's image. So here's the second part. God is visionary, number one. Second part, you and I have this visionary component. It's been bred in us by God. Am I going too fast? Number one, God is visionary. Number two, you have the capacity to be visionary like God. He's given us this ability to see things. Don't know if you've had the chance to go to Elizabeth Key. I haven't yet. But I've been following its progress on that video camera on top of the building on Facebook. Uh, there's a video camera on top of the building where they actually do it in fast motion of how they drew it out, and then they, they dug it out, and then they let the water in, and they cleaned this out, and they built that. And there's this 
video camera that does it really, really fun. But you know, to see this, this beautiful piece of art really for our city, it, it didn't just occur by accident. Someone had a vision many, many years ago, drew it up, communicated that vision, and now we get to experience it. It went from vision to reality, but without the vision, it would never be a reality. Okay? And so God has this ability to be visionary, but you have this ability to be visionary too. We see that in the secular sense with Elizabeth Key, but I'm telling you, with the, the church, with the ministries in this house, your church, God has a vision for the, the ministries in your house. And what we have to do is learn to see the picture of God. God actually wants to impart that vision into us for his glory. That's the third part. God wants to impart his vision into us for his glory. Remember, we're doing or studying leadership from a Christian perspective. So in the secular world, they'll tell you, you need a vision. But I'm here to tell you from a Christian perspective, you need God's vision. That's the difference. We need to hear God's plan, God's vision for our life. And when we achieve it, it will achieve his purposes. Are we okay? What is your vision for your life? Have you actually had a think about what's the vision for your life? Have you actually had a think about what's the vision for your marriage? What's the vision for your career? What's the vision for your children? Do you actually have a picture? See, some of us, we, we, we live this up. We understand we've got a vision and capacity, but we've never stopped to ask God, hey, what is, the, what is your vision for my marriage? <laughs> what is your vision for my elder son or my middle son or my younger son who right now may not be walking with the Lord or who walked away? Or What's God's vision for my business? What's God's vision for the ministry that I'm now involved in? What is God's picture? Because if you haven't got it, can I tell you, you won't actually build it. Until you see it, you can't build it. So if I was to say, okay, everybody, I want you to build Elizabeth Key in Perth. Go! And there's no picture. There's no clear vision. Everybody, go! You may have the best intentions. You can be a hard worker. You can have all the money. But unless you're all working to the same vision, it's never going to become a reality. In fact, your vision of Elizabeth Key might even contradict your vision. And you might be digging out this part while you're putting the sand from your part into the part. And, and so all of a sudden, you have all this conflict because you haven't clearly seen the picture, the plan, the dream. So, this is what you're going to do for a little bit of a chat at the moment. Um, I want you guys here to take your chairs and come across to this table here. I want you guys here, if you could just take your chairs and come and sit over this side here. Uh, two, three, let's say, come and sit over here. That's great, right. if you can come and sit over here. I'm just going to give you some time now to talk and share about a vision of one area of your life. Either your business, one area. Your business, your family, your children, your ministry, one area. What's just one vision? So Matt can tell us his vision for his marriage. What is he seeing? What is the picture he's gonna see for his, we for his marriage? Not his wedding. But his marriage, at the end of his life, what's the picture? All right? Share. Why did you all, why did all three of you to come across here? I'm so sorry. That's a bit silly, isn't it? I should have got you just to come across here. Don't make it up. I mean, you've seen something. If you haven't, that's fine. But we're going to look into it.
when they're older, when they're married? And what are they going to do with their life? What, what sort of character is going to be developed? That's the vision. So let's be honest. Let's just be honest. Who didn't have a vision? A clear vision, a picture for A, their marriage, their family, or their business, or their ministry heads up in one of those areas. Yeah? Okay, good. So here's the encouragement. God wants to give it to you. He wants to give you a clear picture because he wants you to run with it and he wants you to make the vision into a reality so that his kingdom will come, his will be done, his name be glorified but through you. Isn't that powerful? That we can actually please God with our lives by downloading his dream and his plan for us and then actually living according to it so that he gets all the glory. That's the difference between Christian leadership and secular leadership. Secular leadership says, hey, listen, build that business, make it amazing, so at the end of your life, you have enough money to retire early and do whatever you want. Boring. What happens when you achieve that? Still unfulfilled, still unsatisfied, still not living what God has called you and placed you on the earth to do. I don't want that. I want at the end of my life to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. To do that, I need to know what his plan is for my life. Cool? Fantastic. You're all alive and responding well, so I appreciate that. How do I get a vision for my life? Session 1B. Are you ready? How do I get a vision for my life? Now, we know the source is God. We know the source is God. So really, to download a vision from God, you need to spend time with the Lord. Simple, right? He's the giver of vision. So God speaks to Moses in the desert and gives him a vision. God speaks to Abraham and gives him a vision. God speaks to David and gives him a vision. But you know, most times God approached and spoke to people, it was in a time when they set themselves up alone to meet with him. Uh, He sometimes uh, intruded on them when they were alone. Sometimes it was in the time that they would offer an offering to the Lord, and then the Lord would come and speak to Solomon. He spoke to Solomon that way. He spoke to Abraham that way. He spoke to Noah that way. But really, it's when these people made time to encounter the Lord, God made time to give them a vision for him, for their lives. So if you haven't got a vision for your life from the Lord yet, my encouragement is he wants to give it to you, would you just make a bit of time to say, God, give me a picture? Some of us have it for our workplace or for our ministry, but we may not have it for our marriage. So that's okay. Don't beat yourself up. Ask the Lord to show you the picture for your marriage. What is it going to look like, God? How do we please you with our marriage? You know, what, What's your plan for this union or for your children? And you know, it's the tough times where a vision will help you keep the course. Without vision, people cast off restraint. Without vision, you go through a tough time in your marriage. Without a vision that you're going to come through this and it's going to be good and God's got a plan for it, I tell you, you won't come through the ma- you won't sometimes come through it. When your kids are rebelling, but God's t- told you that that boy is going to be a man of God, he's going to preach His word, he's going to live for it. Oh, you have a vision. Hold on to the vision through the tough time because without a vision, you actually cast off restraint. They did all these studies and they found out in the concentration camps uh, up in the World War in World War II, the people who died were the people without a vision that they were going to come through. They lost hope of ever being rescued. Their vision creates hope. And they lost hope. And the moment they lost hope, they all of a sudden lost their will to live. And the people that died never believed that they would ever be rescued. But the ones that went through the worst, in fact, the same sort of conditions, the same sort of living conditions and eating conditions, they went through the same thing, but they stayed alive was because they had a hope, they had a vision that one day someone's going to rescue us. We are not going to die in these concentration camps. 
They had a vision pulling them forward. And so when they came to rescue them, they go, I saw this. I knew this day was coming. It's something that we saw and kept us alive. This vision helped us to stay the course. How important for you and I to have a vision, to hold up to the vision. When all hell breaks loose in this church, and it happens, I'll be honest with you, I remember the vision of God. When all hell breaks loose in our family, I remember the vision of God. So you better have one. So how do we get one? We go to the Lord, the source of visions and dreams, and we make time and we ask, Father, give us a vision for this particular area of our life. Then we need to make sure that that vision is actually God's vision. Because how we know our hearts are very deceptive. And sometimes it's not really God, it's really us. I want to be a multi, multi millionaire so that I have a fancy big boat, says the Lord. So you can give to the church. So you can give to the church. There you go. To give to the pastor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Well, that's the Lord. Not really. <laughs> but you know what I mean? We can sort of color the vision. And we just got to be careful. See, Abraham was given a vision for a nation to come out of him. Yeah. Right? And it would be through him and through Sarah. Sarah. But what happened was he colored it because he thought, this woman's barren. She's gone. Let's color it. I'm going to have a child, but just not through Sarah. And he has Hagar and has Ishmael. And so he makes it happen himself, which was never God's plan. God wanted to, it to be totally miraculous. And so often we can hear a vision and hear a dream, but we color it to make it acceptable, use our own strength, we, we use our own wisdom and our own knowledge. But God says, no, 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 no. I never planned for you to you could do it yourself, then it's not me. The visions of God for your life are sometimes impossible. This is impossible for Joel to lie. This is impossible for us to do this. No way. But God, but God, oh, it's not impossible at all. So there must be this supernatural, miraculous, big, impossible for man aspect to your vision. Don't color it with your own experience. Yes, please. Yes, please. I always check it with the Word of God. 
is this in line with scripture? It's really important because I've had people say to me as a pastor, as the state president, I've had to counsel people and there are people that even say to me, God told me to leave my wife and to go and have, an, not an affair, but to marry this other woman. All right? And they believe that it's God. And of course, you take it to the word of God and say, that doesn't line up with the word. But deception works that way. And we can all be deceived. Our heart is deceptive. Okay, and so it's important that it lines up with the word of God. Here's the second thing uh, to make sure that the vision is from the Lord, um, that it, it, is, it is supported by the wisdom of the counsel around us, godly counsel around us. And I put the word in there, godly counsel, because um, there's a number of people nowadays going to non-Christian counselors who have a complete different value system to the word of God. We are currently living in a time where it's a very dark and unbiblical, ungodly mindset that rules our world. So if you're going to get counsel, can I give you some counsel? Get counsel from people who are based living in the Word. Yes, Brad. I got to share just last year, before I came to Christ, I went to the same counsel. Shopping. 
is you go to somebody and you go, oh, Armel, did you know that I have a problem with Pastor Sharon's leadership? Uh, Armel goes, you know what, you need to deal with it. Oh, who cares what Armel says? You know, Rachel, I really have a problem with Pastor Sharon's leadership. Oh, you agree? She's hurt your feelings too? See, I knew, I knew I was right. Advice shopping, counseling shopping, whoever would agree with me. And we stop taking truth and we stop taking wisdom because we're searching for people who will tickle our ears. And our hearts are deceptive and they do that. And same with the vision. Sometimes we have this vision that is from the soul and we will go to people who will tickle us, uh, you know, and, and give us that. We've got to pick our counselors really, really, really carefully. Okay, here's the third thing. Do circumstances can actually be used by God for his purpose. Now, just just so uh, by itself it's dangerous, okay? They go, oh the circumstance. I had a fight with one of the leaders of the church, so therefore God's calling me out. No. No, 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 no. Okay? By itself, it's very dangerous. But coupled with the word of God, with wise counsel, with the right counselors, you know, God can actually give you circumstances that close doors and open opportunities. Isn't that true? And so sometimes the vision for you, like we, we can be crying over the circumstance, but actually we should be rejoicing that, okay, God, you're making it really clear that that door is closed. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I agree, but I'm going to move on. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Agree, but I'm going to move on. Yeah. All right? Here's the fourth one. Uh, and, and I said, when it comes to circumstances, always go back to wise counsel. Always based on the word of God. But, but there, there's obviously uh, an opportunity for God to work through circumstances. Here, uh, if you're going to know that the vision is from God and not from man, Check your natural desire and wiring. God's not going to ask you to become somebody that you're not. He's not going to ask you to become somebody that you're not. He may challenge you to grow. He may challenge you to uh, expand. It may not always be easy. But he's not going to say, Joel, the vision that I have for your life is that you become Mark. You like everything Mark likes, you become like Mark, you stop being Joel. So if you find that this vision that you feel is from God, it really is not you. It, it's probably not God. Because he created you to be you, to shine as you are. Finally, how do you know if this vision is from God or vision is from yourself? That when you decide to embark on this journey of vision, the peace of God passes all understanding. You must have the peace. The peace does not mean that, oh my goodness, I don't know how this is going to work. But the peace is, regardless of all the things that could go wrong, I'm going to trust. I feel this weight of God saying, yes. I'm on track. Isn't that true? 
a vision that is articulated and shared and communicated. I tell you, our church fed 500 people on Christmas morning. This year, we'll go even more than that, you know, uh, as we go to three campuses in three cities feeding hundreds and hundreds of people because a vision has the power of multiplying the outcome. It's no longer just one plus one. It starts to go from addition to multiplication. If one can put a thousand to five two, if you put ten thousand, doesn't make sense mathematically. So that's what a vision does. It increases the outcome. It increases the the potential. It increases the significance of what can be done. And so we need to understand how important vision is for every leader. In the area that you lead church or your business, if you do not have a vision, you probably don't have people following you clearly. But you're also limiting the results of your ministry. God actually wants to do great things through you. Don't forget that. Fantastic? Yeah. You can have a break. Go. Eat, drink, have a coffee, have a toilet, a break, and continue getting sleeping. So, go, go, go. Come back in... 14 minutes. No, no, no. Not 14. I lie. Nine minutes. Two. Oh, because they've got an hour. Yes. Yeah, they minutes. finish at nine, so. They finish at nine. Yeah. Yes. So, come back. I'm going to give you four minutes. 